Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James and I'm delighted this week to be joined by Jade Moore, who's the course director for the PA course at Anglia Ruskin University. Hi, Jade. Hello. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, no problem. I wanted to get you on the podcast, just hear about your career and your journey through being a physician associate so far. Do you want to take us back to where it all began? So originally I trained in radiotherapy and oncology at the University of Hertfordshire and I can just remember it being in my final year of radiotherapy and oncology and and thinking I need more. There's so much more medicine out there that that I don't know about and I was really intrigued Uh, and then I just came across this advertisement at my university for the this new physician associate program and thought this could be for me and so me and my dad went along to the the open day and I was just absolutely blown away by the profession and the opportunity that it offers yeah I decided to to give it a go and the program began and it was extraordinary it was a, a fantastic experience but very daunting and very overwhelming because we were sort of the trailblazers for the profession at this time and I know now I, I I I often giggle because I hear student PA saying, "Oh, yeah, I have to keep explaining what this role is." And I think, "Crikey, you should have been there in 2008 when literally nobody had a clue um, about the profession." And um, I qualified. I sat the national exam, and I went on to join a practice, a general practice in in Essex. Now, at this time, there were no physician associates working in Essex at all. I was blessed to have a mentor who had done a lot of research on physician assistants from um, America and was a very, very experienced GP. But I have to say my first day of arriving, she did say to me, you know, if they could get hold of a nurse practitioner, they would never have considered um, hiring a PA. So it was, it was uh, interesting. I thought, oh, okay, that's a nice way to start. But it was, it was true at that time, you know, um, there was very little known about physician assistants as we were at that time what they had to offer, um, how they could contribute um, to general practice or to the um, uh, medical community on the whole. But I I always feel very, very thankful and grateful to have had that practice as my first practice in, in Colchester in Essex. The first year was all about condensing all of the education that I'd had um, and just applying it to actually performing as a physician associate and and doing the job. That went on for a whole year that we had that sort of internship. And then I started to look at other things that I wanted to do. So I'd primarily worked really on call, but I decided I wanted to do something that was a little bit more um, routine and um, chronic disease based. Um, so I, I done my Warwick um, diploma in diabetes and that's when my love for diabetes started really. So anybody that knows me knows I have a real passion um, for diabetes care um, and I've spent most of my career focused on um, providing better care and better understanding of um diabetes um in the in the community really type one and, and type two initially started with type two so um i i looked after um our type two our patients with type two diabetes um at, at the practice but as i got more experienced um i started to sort of engage with more training so looking at how to initiate GLP ones um, and how to initiate insulin, um, and then how to switch insulin. So I went and done some more sort of specialised training, um, working with the specialist nurses, um, the diabetologist at Colchester, and also um, doing some clinics with the podiatrists as well. Um, and I, I did become at that point quite specialised in in diabetes and. Um, I started to look after all of our patients with type 1 diabetes, including all the juveniles. I learned how to carb count, how to do correction doses. Um, so I'd, I'd, I started an admission avoidance program. I'd have an on-call phone. So if any of our patients with type 1 or type 2 on insulin um, started to become unwell, then we'd do some correction doses, try to keep them in the community um, as far as you know it's safe to do so. And I got really involved in that. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, that element and aspect of my job. And as time went on, I started to look after the 20% most complex patients with type 2 diabetes and then continued with care for all of our patients with type 1. But my other passion, I've got many passions, I have to say, I just love medicine. 
medicine, really. But my other passion was palliative care. Obviously, I had an undergraduate degree in radiotherapy and oncology, which was very useful in terms of looking after patients at end of life. And my practice decided to get me involved in the Gold Standard Framework meetings. So I started to chair those meetings, started to get really involved in the end of life aspects of general practice, which was very, very rewarding. So I started to do home visit, making sure that that our patients at the end of their life had uh, everything that they needed, things like anticipatory drugs and things were prescribed. And really that the financial side of things that they were aware what was available for them and just to try and make life you know a, a little bit more easier for them I mean in those in those final stages um, and it was again it was a really rewarding element of working uh, working in general practice so I got very much involved in that and later when I moved to another practice I continued that role of um, leading the gold standard framework meetings for for palliative care the other element of my job in general practice was very heavily focused on anticoagulants. So I ran the anticoagulation clinic um, in my first practice. So the warfarin clinic, uh, NOAX or DOAX, if you want to call it, they didn't exist at that time. So it was all warfarin. So I'd initiate a warfarin and then manage patients that were on warfarin. So we, we had um, point of care testing in-house and I would sort of be responsible for looking after patients that, that were on warfarin. Now, when I moved to my new practice, they didn't have an in-house warfarin clinic. So I actually set up a warfarin or anticoagulant clinic in Braintree, which is still running now. I trained the nurses, the AMPs, the healthcare assistant, how to do point of care testing, how to use the INR our system and how to sort of manage uh, patients that are on warfarin. And I started to get involved in surgical bridging of um, anticoagulants as well. So I'd work very closely with secondary care in terms of preparing patients that were on anticoagulant for surgery. So uh, that was uh, a, another very, very um, interesting element of, of my role. So yeah, I, I picked up a, a few skills as I went along. I also used to do contraceptive implant insertions and removals which I, I love doing it was more sort of task based so it just it, it, it gave me a, an opportunity to do more practical skills yeah so I, I did enjoy that the mix up of, of that and I did start to do um, the training for uh, joint injections as well um, but inevitably uh, Anglia Ruskin found me um, and stole me before I could uh, comp- complete that training in, in general practice it's a very diverse role and I, you know, I, I say to my students that, that this job is is what you make of it, really. I think that's what's so wonderful about about the profession is that the job is what you make of it. In the first instance, I see myself really as a mop for general practice. So I used to think, you know, whatever the whatever the need is in that practice, whatever gap they have, I'll fill it. You know, I'll, I'll take it. So that's where diabetes. I, I had no interest in diabetes to, um, at, at first. You know, there, this this gap in the service came up, and I thought, well, you know, I am a mop. I'm I'm going to come in and I'm going to mop up that need. And that's very much how I sort of seen my role uh, through the years, uh, which I love actually, because it pushes me into areas perhaps I hadn't have thought of before. I haven't actually done anything um, in general practice, which I haven't enjoyed. Um, so it, it's been a really challenging, but exciting and thoroughly, thoroughly rewarding career for me in, in general practice, I would say. Amazing. Wow. I had no idea you had all of that behind you. You hinted at Anglia Ruskin finding you and bringing you on board for a more academic role. Yes. Yeah, so I received an email whilst I was in general practice to ask if I would go and advise the university on this new course that they were considering delivering. So I, I went over to the Postgraduate Medical Institute and acted as an expert advisor to the dean's group on the physician associate program. And through that sort of experience, in the validation experience, I decided that I was going to apply for a part-time role at Anglia Ruskin, just teaching on, on the course, which I have to say did at times feel like I was doing two full-time jobs. So it did, it did really keep me very, very busy. Then over the course of time, I gradually started picking up more days, which led me to sort of becoming full-time at, at Anglia Ruskin. And when the course moved over to the School of Medicine about a year and a half ago, I actually took over as, as the course leader at that point. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's wonderful. I mean, I, I always get, get very, very passionate about speak, you know, speaking about my students and um, the experience that, that they have, particularly since we've we've moved it over to, to the School of Medicine. The School of Medicine is it's a new building, as you know, it's a it's it's, a, it's only been open a couple of years. So we've got some real state of the art um, facilities. We're very, very lucky. We've got, you know, mini GP surgery with uh, six consulting rooms. We've got two 
uh, ward areas, which are just fantastic and some really uh, state of the art equipment. I couldn't run the course without the support that we get from our our placement partners. So in Essex, they've really embraced the role, both the, you know, the trusts um, and the community, the GP practices, they've really embraced the role. They they really have got stuck into uh, supporting the students, training the students, and then actually opening posts for them um, at, at the end of it as well. So working alongside our, our colleagues in the community, um, it has been has been you know very very rewarding, um, and we've mo- come a long way from me being the only PA in Essex. You know back in two thousand and ten, we've now got many many PAs working in a you know range of specialities. Great, thank you. What advice would you give to any PAs that are listening to this at the moment who want to get into academia in teaching um, medical education? I think initially it would be really really helpful to get in contact with the program that's local to you and just ask if perhaps you can come in and either do some shadowing or um, act as volunteers so we have an examiners group so PAs can come and join our examiners group it is voluntary Um, they can then get involved in the assessment side of things so they can come in as OSCE examiners and examine our students and it just gives them a little feel for how how academia runs and what's in you know involved in the the work of of an academic so almost always an opportunity to um, go in and deliver some teaching on a voluntary basis so if you are interested and you have a particular area of interest that you quite fancy teaching um, PA students about do contact um, the, your local program lead and and just um, voice your interest and I would be very surprised if they weren't you know accommodating to allowing you to come in and get involved in in a little bit of teaching. If you decide that teaching is something that you are really interested in, the postgraduate certificate in medical education um, can support with that. So just really giving you a little bit more information about academia on the whole, assessments and um, how different people learn. And the course is just a really good to set you up um, as a junior academic. Um, and then you can look to join in as an associate lecturer. So I often recruit my graduates as associate lecturers to come in and do some teaching um, on the programme. Program. And it's great for the students as well to, to meet other PAs that are out there working. Um, I mean, we are very lucky. We have a role called a practice educator in um, in our trust. So we um, we worked with Health Education England um, to sponsor a new project um, called the Practice Educator. So we appointed a PA um, in each trust to act as a bridge between the university and clinical practice. Each week they do um, a couple of hours of teaching in the hospital with the PA students, but they also communicate very closely with the academic team at the university. So that's been an opportunity for them to get involved. Um, Most of them are quite um, newly qualified um, and they tend to be um, our graduates that know the trust, know the um, know their staff, know the facilities, so that they and know the university, so they can act as that um, as that bridge. But it's been a really good opportunity for for um, those people to express an interest in becoming a practice educator, and then starting um, delivering those couple of hours of teaching each week in the clinical environment. Um, there's one more thing that I'd like to talk about, if that's OK. I would just like to give a mention to my students, actually, um, and the service that they have provided through the pandemic. So my course kept our students out. Obviously, all were risk assessed and, and placed in appropriate areas or withdrawn if the um, risk assessment was, was too high. But the vast majority of my students have worked all the way through the pandemic. And in Harlow, they actually supported a service which myself and a surgeon set up called the virtual visiting service what we done we set up a virtual outpatients clinic using the virtual outpatient software and uh, families that hadn't seen their relatives for an extended period of time because of visiting being prohibited during the pandemic were actually able to see their families for the first time in sometimes months through the virtual visiting service and in the early days it was actually physician associate students that completely 
held up and run this whole service and it wasn't just routine visits that they done they also done end of life visits so patients that were you know actively dying got to say farewell to their family and their family to them thanks to the physician associate students that were working within this particular trust. It was an extraordinary thing that they'd done. And I worked alongside them. And it was it was a lot of pressure. I mean, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic, where there was a, it was very, very stressful, very upsetting. Uh, we didn't know as much as we know now about coronavirus. And it was we were learning day by day, we were all learning, in, including, you know, the very experienced medical teams, we started the service on the end of life ward, we eventually rolled it out to every ward in, in the hospital. And I've still got students now that are, are working on that virtual visiting service as volunteers, you know, this is this is a voluntary service. And they come in, um, at weekends for that service to go ahead and actually some of them work Christmas Day as well to to make sure that families could see one another um, on on Christmas Day it's been an extraordinary service that the, that the physician um, physician associate students have provided um, as I say I worked alongside them and I've worked in palliative care for 15 years and um, you know on one occasion myself and, and, and one of my students were, were working on the end of life ward and we had two particularly difficult final calls which made me very very tearful actually and and um, I was you know had a student with me at the time and I sort of came out and I had to sit in my car for quite some time after and and just you know ga- gather myself and gather my thoughts so and that's with 15 years experience so for these students to to um, manage that. I mean, we had lots of debriefing and lots of support available for them, but it was just extraordinary. And I was, I'm just so, so proud. I'm always so proud of my students anyway, but for this particular service um, that, that that they delivered, I was just, uh, just so proud. And, and even now I'm hearing every day stories from the consultants about what an impact my students are having on the wards where staffing are depleted because of corona and isolation and how they're supporting the consultants and how they're supporting the patients and what difference they're making being out there but they just want to be there and they just want to help you know one of my students contacted me a couple of weeks ago and said she had she'd worked 14 hours in surgery they had lots of emergency surgeries and they were so short staffed and she just wanted to be there and she wanted to help and she had all of this fantastic exposure working uh, alongside the consultant and at the end of the day the consultant said thank you so much I I really don't know what I would have done today without you and that was that just completely made her day so I think we really need to appreciate the service that the, the PA students are offering at the moment I feel I need to mention that because I am I'm so proud of my students at Anglia Ruskin for for all that they're, they're providing to all of the services in, in Essex and uh, across Cambridge as well at the moment. So uh, I send my um, thanks thanks to them for their professionalism and um, um, and yeah my just beaming pride um, for all of their positive reports that we've had. Oh, that's lovely to hear! What an amazing time for these students to be contributing. If I ask you to think back over your career as a PA and an educator at the moment, what's been the most challenging or the most difficult part that you've gone through? Um, I think, you know, it it was always going to be difficult to be one of the first physician associates practicing, um, and you know, particularly the first physician associate in Essex. But I'm quite an easygoing person. uh, So, you know, when I would be asked lots of questions I was always very happy to to answer them or if I was making a referral over to secondary care and I was making a referral over to perhaps a a doctor that didn't know what a PA was and we didn't really know how to respond to that I I always felt very well equipped to, to deal with that and I had a very very supportive team around me and it's quite remarkable that really I've gone through my whole career without having much resistance from um, the the medical community, and I've always been really, you know, embraced and very, very well supported. So I think for me that element has never really been been a problem, and I think Essex has been really open minded to the the role of the physician associate, which has made life a you know a lot lot easier for me. So I haven't really faced the challenges in that respect that I know some uh, physician associates have sadly faced. But I think also you know mindset is, it plays a very very important part in that. If you if you're coming into this role, you, you you're coming in understanding that this is a new role and you are in charge and you are responsible for representing the role um, in a, in a positive way. 
Do you think that knowledge that PA students come in with, that we are by no means pushing on an open door sometimes, do you think that helps? I think so. I think it, um, I think it, prepares them um to be a little bit more resilient um but I, I i also think that um how pas are treated is not fairly represented um on social media so i think you know i read a lot of this you know um i know you call them keyboard warriors and um this negativity against pas and and it, it saddens me because i think well that's not my experience actually and um you know from um AMPs, healthcare assistants, you know, nurse, nursing colleagues to to our doctor colleagues, physios, you know, every role I have encountered has been extraordinarily supportive and has um has helped build me as the professional that I am today. I mean, AMPs in particular have played a huge role in my um in my clinical development. And I'm very, very thankful for that. So I think I think we have to be wary of what we read online and I think we have to be um responsible with our um, junior colleagues in saying you know um it, it at times it can be difficult at times it can be tough um but actually um the positivity around this role um far outweighs the the, the negativity um and in in reality actually when you're a face and you're not just a professional title people are much kinder um and people are really responsible and and, and reasonable i would echo that as well definitely Working with some of my AMP colleagues on a day-to-day basis has been, you know, some of the most supportive and most helpful people that I've come across. It's very easy to get sucked into seeing one comment on social media that skews your thoughts, isn't it? But the large experience of most of us is is positive. Last question for me. How's the best way for somebody to get in touch with you, Jed? I think through email is probably um is probably the best way. Thank you. And I'll leave your contact details in the show notes below on this episode so people can find them there. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for listening to the Precision Associate Podcast.